All right. Um, good morning and welcome to week three of our online services. I'm um, glad you're able to join us um, to continue to put forth the Word of God, to continue to worship together um, as a family of believers. Um, I know it's not the same. I know it's not, you know, typical. We'd love to all be together in one place. Um, and I look forward to that when we can return. Um, that's going to be a celebration. Um, but at the same time, we can continue to do that here and now um, in this place and in our homes, um, wherever you might happen to be. Um, I just want to encourage you. I want to thank you for all of the people who have been viewing and seeing it all, um, seeing the truth go forth. Um, it's gone to many more people than I think we could possibly have imagined. I want to thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Um, the tithe has continued to come in. Um, I just want to thank you for your generosity in this time. I know it's unusual. I know maybe some of you are also experiencing struggles in your own finances at home, and if that is you and if you need help, um, please do not hesitate to reach out. Please continue to let us know um, how the body of Christ can come around and support you and help you. And lastly, I want to just encourage you, throughout this week leading up to Easter, um, I found a devotional um, that I want to share with you guys. So each day I'm going to send out a devotional through the email app um, that comes through. So if you don't have that, if you're not part of the directory app, please let me know. Reach out to me. Shoot me a call. I'm a text, an email, whatever. Um, we'd like to get you set up on that so we can send out this devotional to you day by day to remind ourselves and prepare our hearts for the Easter season as we go forth. Um, with that, let's go ahead and get back into worship, and we'll come back for the word.
God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of
us ways to encourage one another. Can you give us ways to show your light to the watching world right now? Whether it be through a text message to a friend, whether it be through a Facebook post, whether it be through a phone call or a letter, we want to shine for you. Show us ways to encourage one another. Show us ways to shine your light. When the darkness seems to vanish, and we shine light. That peace, the peace that passes all understanding, would begin to go forth from our lives. We want to shine for you. Let's sing a song last time. This little light of mine, oh, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Jesus, we want to shine for you. Jesus, you placed your church as a city on a hill, as a lamp upon a lampstand. And you don't hide us away, Jesus. You've placed us on this earth to declare your kingdom, to declare truth about you, to bring light into darkness, to show your peace to the watching world, peace that passes understanding and that only comes from you. Jesus, you've put us here to declare the truth of your word, and to preach it with boldness. Holy Spirit, would you equip us to preach your word with boldness, especially coming into Easter, that even though we're distant from one another, even though we can't gather with one another, that you would give us a ways to encourage one another, to reach out maybe to family members who would never come to church, but maybe have um, ways to watch us online they feel comfortable doing that? Would we reach out to the ones around us? Would this be a time of actually binding together in love that we would become closer as a body, Jesus? That each one of our lights, though it may be little, can shine for you. And would we all choose to let our light shine? It becomes a flame. It becomes bigger and bigger. It says in your word to let your light shine before men that they might see the goodness of the Father. Jesus, we shine for you this week. We thank you for your blessing. We thank you for your peace that we know when we share that with others. We love you, Jesus. Again, good morning and welcome. Um, thank you, worship team. Um, thank you for allowing yourselves to be stretched, allowing yourselves to be pulled out of your comfort zones. Um, it's just an amazing thing to listen to and to watch week after week as the worship team allows themselves to be stretched. And as we were singing that song, So Will I, um, it's just a reminder to me as we've been going through these last few weeks, if you haven't been with us, but we've been talking about leaning into respectable sins. And the amazing thing about that song is when you think about it, as you sang through those different you know, lines in the, in the music, and we sit there and you sang them, and everything else bows down, everything else listens, everything else is obedient to the king. Except for us, a lot of times. And that's exactly part of the problem. That's exactly why this, this series has, I guess, been put into place in some regards, is because we too, I pray that that song was a heart's cry, that you too would bow down that you too would yield, that you too would live and be obedient to the things that he asks you, right? So often in that song we said, so will I, right? And I pray that that's your heart's desire, that you will too, that you desire to see him glorified in everything, that you desire to let your light shine before a watching world, right? Pay me more now than ever because we're not gathering on a Sunday. We're gathering in multiple places on a Sunday. 
We have multiple opportunities to invite people, to share the truth of the gospel with people. And that's where we were at last week. Last week we started to look at the remedy for sin and that being the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel meaning the finished work of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. And his present work in us via the Holy Spirit. And we didn't get to that part of the gospel. We didn't get into the Holy Spirit last week. And so we're going to get into that this week. And maybe not as in-depth as he needs to. But I think he's a lot, oftentimes a forgotten part of the Trinity, if you will. The Holy Spirit gets left out. But I hope that we'll see today in just a little bit, in a little aspect at least, of how absolutely crucial he is to us living a victorious life. How absolutely crucial he is to us being able to face and overcome the subtle, respectable sins that we hold on to too often. And so as we looked in last week, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, just going to read that one verse. I gave you several others that you could have looked at, and I pray that as you went through this week, you took some time, and maybe you looked up other verses that correlated or, or followed through with the gospel message. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Now, brothers, right, I want to remind you of the gospel. I preached to you which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. And there's the fullness of the Gospel. Christ came to die for sin. He came for sick people like me. And He came for sick people like you, people who are in desperate need of a Savior, people who are in desperate need of hope because we didn't have one before. Right? And we need that hope. We need that promise. We need that assurance. And any one of the other million other ones that are out there, if Scripture, not, maybe not millions, because maybe there's not that many verses. Maybe I over-exaggerated that one a little bit. Right? Forgive me for that one as I was just thinking about that. But there's tons of other Scriptures out there that tie to the Gospel. And I pray that you've been doing just that. Right? That's why we went back to Martin Luther about preaching the Gospel all to ourselves every day. Right? And you know, maybe those exact words weren't out there in Martin Luther's, but a, a, a statement that he was reworded into that understanding that we need to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. And we looked at last week, there's reasons why. The first is that the gospel is only for sinners. The gospel is only for sinners like me and sinners like you. Those who are willing to own up to the fact that they fall short of God's glorious standard all the time. Right? There isn't a day that goes by that in some word, thought, or deed, or all three of those things, right, that I don't fall short, that I don't step into sin, that I don't need forgiveness, that I don't need to be reminded of the goodness of God. It's always there. Doesn't, there's not a day that's gone by that I can honestly say that I didn't need to hear the gospel message. We also looked at last week, the gospel frees me up to face my sin. And it frees you up to face your sin. And it frees you up, it gives you the ability to own up to your sin because you realize that God's not this angry judge sitting there waiting to punish us. Instead, he's there as a loving father wanting to lead us and guide us. Now, if you're a sinner and if, you're, if you've never repented, if you haven't confessed, if you're not trusting in Christ, you have to face judgment. That is an assured thing. There will be no question about it. One day, every one of us will face the judge. And we can either stand in Christ's righteousness and his holiness and his perfection, or on the other hand, we can stand in our own thing and we can start to put our own case before the Savior, before the King, and go, here's why I shouldn't. And he's going to go, no, 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 sorry, doesn't measure up. Don't meet the standard. Not enough. Right? And, and so the gospel, the truth that God sent his son to die, he frees us up to be able to face our sin because we all know that we have it. And then lastly, we, we talked about the fact that the gospel motivates and energizes us to deal with our sin. It motivates us. It energizes us. If God loves me that much, Right? And if he's not holding my sin against me, and he's not holding your sin against you, why would we hold back? Right? It should be the energizer behind us going, you know what, God, I want to get rid of this. I want to be cleansed. I want to be like you. I want my light to shine. Right? We just sang the song, this little light of mine, right? I'm going to let it shine. And you remember part of that song, it goes, I'm not going to let the enemy blow it out. Right? I'm not going to let him blow it out. But unfortunately, so often what happens is as we fall into sin, that light flickers and that light fades and that light gets covered up a little bit. Does that mean the light's out? No, not at all. But the light's still there, but it's not necessarily as bright and as bold as it should be. 
So the gospel motivates you and I, or at least it should, to deal with your sin, right? Because the judge is no longer holding you accountable. And then as I closed out last week, we talked about the fact, and we took about a few scriptures, a couple of them, of how we could summarize and how we could reword some of these scriptures and personalize them to ourselves. Specifically, we looked at Galatians chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, how the Apostle Paul made it for himself, right? It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, and he's the one who died for me and gave himself up for my sins, and we personalized it because it's true, right? Christ died for the world, but more importantly, he died for me. But we can't lose either perspective, right? He died for you personally, but he also died corporately, you know, worldwide, you know, out there at the same time. And then I personalized 1 John 4.10 in this way. And this is love. Not that I have loved God, but that he loved me, big bold me, and sent his son to be the propitiation to bear the wrath of God for my sins. That there's ways we can take the scriptures and the gospel message and personalize them back to ourselves. And my guess is you probably didn't get much beyond shutting off your computer, shutting off your TV screen, turning off your phone, whatever it might be, right? I didn't get much far either out of this place when I stepped off the stage and I go, but hey, what about the daily struggle I have with sin? <laughs> I, I, I know that it's there. I know that these things are true. I know that God's died and I want to face those sins, but is there hope that someday, right, I can see progress in putting them to death? That I'll become less impatient, that I'll become less angry, that I'll become fill in the blank, right? Whatever that respectable sin is that you're holding on to. And the answer, as I said last week, was a resounding yes. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. There's no question about it, right? We will be able to and we will see progress in our lives if we're willing to confront these respectable sins we're going to talk about. Are we going to do that by ourselves? No. Right? Of course not. Right? We'll be able to overcome these things. We'll see progress with help, of course. Flip with me, if you will, to John chapter 14, the Gospel of John chapter 14. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's, he's leading them through. He's about to the end of his ministry. He knows what's coming. But he's aware of the end. It's, it's getting near. And we come to John chapter 14, starting in verse 15. Right? Here's the amazing thing. There's a promise here. And I want you to catch the promise because this promise is crucial to our going forward in the rest of this message. If you love me, verse 15, you will obey what I command. Verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. He will send a counselor. He will send another. He will send one to come alongside of us to help us, to lead us and to guide us down the pathway that only he can do. And so this is important, right? We need to understand that Jesus understood that left to ourselves, left to our own devices, even with his payment for, the, for our sin, even though the fact that he propitiated for it. He suffered the wrath. He bore it all on the cross. He goes, I know if that's all I do, it's enough on one sense, but they're not going to have victory over day-to-day sin in their lives. They need a helper. They can't do it by themselves. They can't do it just themselves and their brothers and their sisters in the world. They need somebody else to come alongside. And, they, and so Jesus says, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send you a helper to come alongside. And that brings me to where I want to start off today's message is in Galatians chapter 15. I mentioned it briefly last week. Galatians chapter 15. We started talking about a battle. And we know in Romans 7, the Apostle Paul talks about battle all the time. He talks about this battle, the struggle he was having with sin in in his inner man and in his external man, I guess, in his physical structure. But Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. Actually, we'll read 16 through 18 says this, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. So I say, this is the Apostle Paul, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And so John Piper, in a quote on this passage of Scripture, says this. He goes, if the Christian life looks too hard, and sometimes maybe we look at these respectable sins in our lives and we go, man, you know what? I've been struggling with these things for, you know, maybe months or years or decades. I'm like, it's just too difficult. I haven't made any success. I haven't been able to get over them. 
Because if it looks too hard, we must remember that we're not called to live it by ourselves. Right? We were never called to live this Christian life by ourselves. We must live it by the Spirit of God. Right? The problem that we get into is when we try to live this spiritual, live this spiritual life, when we try to overcome subtle sins or major sins, by ourselves, in our own strength. All the while, we, we failing to remember, right? failing to remind ourselves that this physical frame, this mind that's still here, isn't fully renewed, and so it still struggles with those old habits of sin. It still deals with the temptation of the enemy. We still live in a broken and fallen world. And we think we can do it by ourselves. But Jesus said again in John 16, 7, that he would send a helper. The problem is, is if you're a lot like me, or maybe even just a little bit like me, too often we choose to ignore his help. And we get that prompt, and we kind of sense that the Holy Spirit's going, hey, I want to help you. And I go, no, 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 I got this. Thanks, the Holy Spirit, but you know what, I, I don't think I need your help in this one. I think I, you know, I, got, I understand what I'm supposed to do. I got this. And he goes, hmm. Okay, you don't want my help. And he's too much of a gentleman to force himself upon us. And he goes, okay, go ahead. <laughs> Try it. See what happens. And then you know as well as I do that so often when we go that path and we try to do it by ourselves and we choose to follow the flesh, I can take care of this myself, we fall flat on our face and we fail. And when we choose to fail all the time, right, we, even though we know we thought, you know, we thought we knew better, Hopefully, we can come back to the Holy Spirit in those moments because he's patient. And he goes, okay, John, how did that work for you? And I got to confess and go, you know, that didn't work real well. <laughs> I thought I had that one. I thought I, I, you know, I thought I had licked that sin in my life, but, you know, I, I guess my flesh got the better of me. He goes, yeah, I know. Do you want some, you want some help now? And I get to humble myself and go, yeah, you know what, I guess I do. And I guess I can't do this by myself. Right? The problem is, is we were never meant to overcome these subtle sins. We were never meant to live the Christian lives by ourselves. And my guess is if you've been walking with Christ any duration of time, if you've been living the Christian life any bit of time, you've come to see it too. And you know what's true because you failed at it when you've tried to live it by yourself. So I wanted to break these two verses apart, verses 16 and 17. What does it mean to walk by the Spirit? We caught it in verse 18 as we read through it, right? But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. It continues on, right? If you are led by the Spirit. Now, the Apostle Paul could have taken that in the context and said, if you follow the Spirit, right, you're not under the law, which would be absolutely true. But instead, he takes it to, 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 to emphasize and to look at and to make the focus the Holy Spirit's work. The Holy Spirit is leading us in this walk if we'll allow him to. And one author puts it this way, he goes, the spirit is not like a leader in the pace car in the Daytona 500. And many of you have watched races. And there's a pace car that sets it around as they start off or whatever, and it's going, and all the cars are following in their own strength. Right, there's the key, right? The pace car is not doing anything for all the people behind them. It's literally just setting the pace. That's not the way the Holy Spirit works. Right, the Holy Spirit instead is more of a leader like a locomotive on a train. We don't follow in our own strength. Instead, right, we're led by his power. Right, the rest of the cars behind the train don't have any power in themselves. And the reality is, I think that's very freeing when we start to realize that in myself and in yourselves, we really don't have any power. The power comes from Christ. The power comes through the Holy Spirit. The ability to overcome and to live a victorious Christian life is, by, is dependent upon how connected we are to the Holy Spirit. If we stay connected with Him, we have a lot of power. If we don't stay connected to Him, we lose that source. So the work of the Spirit is emphasized in there. And what it means to walk by the Spirit, we'll talk about it in a second, but it means to yield ourselves and to set ourselves up under the promises of God. Right? To completely live our lives dependent upon the fact that this word is true. That God is who God says he is. That Jesus did and said is who he says he is. The Holy Spirit is yes and amen. Right? But everything he says is going to come to pass. And how many promises are found throughout scripture for us as followers of Christ. 
And for those who aren't followers of Christ, there's promises to them too, right, that they will face judgment. Right, but we have to ground ourselves in the promises. And so why is it crucial to live in order to walk by the Spirit? Look at verse 16. I say live by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. What a promise, eh? <laughs> if you'll live by the Spirit, if you'll walk by the Spirit, you won't gratify the desires of the sinful nature. You won't find yourself constantly stumbling into sin. Slowly but surely, you'll see progress in life. It's a promise. It's a guarantee, right? If you live by the Spirit, you will. Not you may or you might or maybe. No. It's you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. The NASB says it, puts it this way, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. How many of us are tired of carrying out the desires of the flesh? Right? There's so many times that I, I go through life and I'm like, why did I just do that again? I just don't get it. Right? And I'm getting tired of carrying out the desires of the flesh. Because I know they're not satisfying. I know they're not long-lasting. I know they're not what God would have me to do, and so why do I keep doing them? And the only way that to get over that is to live by the Spirit. And so let's talk about the flesh for a minute. Right? It says if you, if, you, if you live by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature, which is the flesh. And if you look at the flesh, it's the ego which feels I can do this on my own. Anybody struggle with that? Any of us have an ego? Probably most of us, right? If we're honest, we have an ego, right? And maybe in my private time, I don't have as big of an ego. But when I'm in a public setting, my ego grows a little bit because I guys want you guys to think stuff about me that maybe I shouldn't have you think about me because I'm afraid that if you knew the real me, you know, all these things play into play, right? If you really knew me, if you really saw me, you wouldn't really love me, and then you'd judge me, and then and you go, stop it. Because then the flesh kicks in and the flesh does all these little subtle sins to guard itself and to protect itself and to justify itself. And it needs to stop. The flesh is the I who tries to satisfy me with anything but God's mercy. Right? Anything but God. Right? I, the flesh really wants anything but God because the flesh looks at God and says, it's very restricting. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. Romans chapter 8, verse 7. It says, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. Right? The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. The basic mark of the flesh is that it is unsubmissive. The basic mark of this, uh, this unrenewed being, of this flesh, of this inner man that still sits there and, and fights against the spirit in us, right? the core of who he is is unsubmissive. Does that not sound like Satan, right? No, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to be like you. I'm going to know all these things, and I'm going to be in charge. Sounds like Adam and Eve, right? It's what they tempted them with, right? Satan comes in and he goes, you'll be like God. You don't, won't need to submit to him because you'll be like him. You'll know the things he knows. And the flesh would love that. The flesh would long for that, where it doesn't have to be submissive. And if that's the case, if the mind that is set on the flesh, that's why Romans 12, 1, right, be transformed by the renewing of your mind is so crucial. Right? Because if your mind is set on the things of the flesh and of the world, guess where it's going to go? It's going to go that path. But if the mind right, is set on the things of God and is set on the Spirit, right, is, is looking at the truth of the Word, we're going to see that become the pattern of our lives over the course of time. So knowing that those two forces are, at ba are out there all the time, right? there's the flesh and there's the spirit, and they're constantly at battle, we start to realize where verse 17 comes into play. The sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. Sounds like Paul in Romans 7. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I keep doing. And it sounds like me, because I could put myself in Paul's place, and I go, I sit there and I constantly struggle with this. And the thing is, there's, a, there's, a, there's an encouragement in this verse 17. The main thing to learn from this verse is that Christians experience struggles within. Here's the challenge. Here's the caution. Right? If you don't sense the struggle going on on the inside, I'm concerned. 
But if you don't sense a battle going in, if you don't sense this, this, this tug of war taking place in your inner man, I'm concerned. Because the only way that that wouldn't be going on, actually there's two ways, right? And, and one of them would be if you're on this far end out there, you know, perfected in, 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 in God's presence, completely delivered from the presence of sin, then it won't happen. Right? There won't be this struggle there anymore, right? There'll be a day when we're completely at rest and we completely find peace. Or, right, here's the other side of it, here's the dangerous side of it. If there's not a struggle going on in the inside, then you don't have the Spirit on the inside. And if you don't have the Spirit on the inside, that means you don't have salvation. And if you don't have salvation, that means at some point, right, you're going to face eternal separation from God, and I'm going to face eternal separation from you because you're not saved. As Christians, we constantly should be having this struggle in us. Hopefully that struggle gets less and less over the course of time. But I think there's always going to be the struggle. And I'm always thankful that Paul put at the end of Romans 7 in verse 24, he goes and he explains this whole struggle that I think many of us have. And he gets to the end and he goes, miserable, wretched man that I am. Right? He acknowledges his sinfulness and he goes, who will save me? (laughs) Who will save me from all this? And he goes, thank you to God. Right? Through our Lord Jesus Christ who set me free and who set, you know, and he, and he basically portrays the gospel to me. And he's preaching to himself. But he's, he's given this epitome of who he is. And he goes, huh, guess what? Who's going to save you, Paul? And he goes, I know who's going to save me. Right? Thank you, Lord, that you sent your son to die for me. That we can go forward. So this inner conflict isn't bad. Christians aren't those who are perfect. Newsflash, right? <laughs> Some of you maybe thought you were perfect. No, I'm good. I'm perfect. Really? No, we're not. So it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not an earth-shattering news out there right, that we have no bad desires. We're going to have them. But there's a war going on. John Piper says this. He goes, conflict in your soul is not all bad. Even though we long for the day when our flesh will be utterly defunct and only pure and loving desires will fill our hearts, yet there is something worse than the war within between flesh and spirit, namely no war within because the flesh controls the citadel and all its outposts. Right? The flesh controls everything, and that's a scary spot to be if the flesh is in that spot. Right? So I want to encourage you, I want you to rejoice a little bit that there's a war within, right? that there's a struggle going on. That's a healthy thing, that there's a battle raging on the inside. That you're going, I know I, don't, I shouldn't be doing this, but you know, I, I, I don't know what to do with it. That's good. Let that push you, let that drive you, let that you know, motivate you. To draw close to Christ. And let Him give you the strength and the power to overcome it. Turn to Him. God, I can't do this by myself. And so verse 16 and 17, as I said last week briefly, verse 16 says there is promise in there that you will not gratify it if you'll live by the Spirit. When you walk by the Spirit, when you submit to the truth of God's Word, when you find comfort and you find promise and you hope in the promises of God, and when you rest in that, going, God, I know what you've said, I know what you've done, I know who I am, and I can rest in those things, right? I start to see the desires of the flesh cut off. I start to see the subtle sins in my life not have so much pull anymore. And I start to see those subtle sins be, being put to death in an increasing fashion. And I'll close this portion of the, of, the, of the sermon with John Piper's summation of what he just said about the conflict in your soul. He says the Spirit, right, this is the awesome part about verse 16, he says the Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, has captured the capital and broken the back of the resistance movement. Right, the Holy Spirit, right, when we came to salvation in Christ, he broke in and he says, ah, guess what, this is mine now. This, this, this fortress, this temple, this person, is mine. He goes, the flesh is as good as dead. Its doom is sure. Is the flesh dead yet? No. But it's going to be. There's a promise out there. right? It's going to happen. But there are outlying pockets of resistance. The guerrillas of the flesh will not lay down their arms and must be fought back daily. The only way to do it is by the Spirit. And that's what it means to walk by the Spirit. The only way to push these things back of the flesh is to trust in Him. To live your life in Christ. 
to allow that, that faith that we, that we proclaim with our lips to take root in our spirit and to live out of that reality. Right? You, live in, you live by the Spirit, you walk by the Spirit when you allow Him to control you by keeping your heart happy in God. Are you happy in God today? Are you joyful in the fact that He has set you free? Are you joyful in the fact, I know it's coming into Easter, and so it's a lot easier to have joy going on. Right? Are you happy in Him today? Are you satisfied in the things of God? Are you at peace with your life with God? Right? God, I know who you are and I know what you've done. Do you find peace in that? Because that's the key to walking by the Spirit. Right? The Spirit constantly reminds us of all that Christ has done. And as we allow Him to remind us of what Christ has done, we find increasing peace in our lives. And slowly but surely, right, the Holy Spirit will work the miracle of renewal in your life when you start meditating on His promises. Right? When you start saturating your spirit, right? when you preach the gospel to yourself daily, when you remind yourself of the goodness of God. George Mueller, right, who ran an orphanage, and he's a great man of faith in the past, and I've read many of his, a couple, I shouldn't say many, a couple of his books, right? But George Mueller learned the secret of walking by the Spirit. Right? He says, meditate on the precious truths of the Word of God until your heart is happy with God. Right? Until you, or not until, you're happy, until your heart is happy in God, not with God, in God. And this is the exact quote that he puts out there, he goes, I saw more clearly than ever that the first great and primary business to which I ought to attend every day was to have my soul happy in the Lord. The first thing to be concerned about was not how much I might serve the Lord or how I might glorify the Lord, but how I might get my soul into a happy state and how my inner man might be nourished. Right? When was the last time you were concerned with your inner man being nourished? Right? Is that the driver of your, of, your, of your life going, I need to make sure the inner man's taken care of because the inner man is crucial to what the outer man lives like. George Mueller goes, I've, I've come to see that that's so crucial to nourish the inner man. He goes, and, and he continues on a little bit. He goes, now nah, what is the food for the inner man? What is the food for the inner man? Not prayer, but the word of God. Right? Give us this day our daily bread. <laughs> right? Daily bread. Right, going through the scriptures, finding promises that are out there, finding the truth of what God says, and allowing those things to be filled in our hearts to feed our spiritual man, and let the Holy Spirit take those truths and bring them to life. Let the Holy Spirit take those truths and motivate us to move forward. And as we walk by the Spirit, right, as we put the truth of God's Word in, and other places throughout the Gospels it says that the Holy Spirit will bring back to remembrance everything that's been taught, the Holy Spirit's job, right, to bring back to remembrance. But if he's going to bring it back to remembrance, that means I have to put it in in the first place, correct? I have to put it in. You have to put it in. Right? The Holy Spirit doesn't just take this book and, you know, we can sleep on it and go, the Holy Spirit's going to bring it in there. No, he's not going to do that. Right? We have the responsibility to read it and put it in so that in due time when it's needed the Holy Spirit can bring it to remembrance. I can only think of like Jesus, right? He's sitting there and he's spending all this time with his Father and he's allowing these truths to be saturated. He's read the Old Testament and he's been brought out into the desert and that Satan is there tempting him. Right? Do these things and he even takes the word and he twists it a little bit. And yet Jesus, every time, all those temptations, what does he do? He reminds Satan, he brings back and he speaks forth the truth of the word. Because the Holy, Spirit, the Holy Spirit brings it back when it's needed. I'm not sitting there thinking Jesus is going, okay, I know I read that. I know it's there. I got it. I, I read it as a kid and I was in my mom and dad. No, I don't think he did that. I think he read it as a kid and his mom and dad maybe trained him in some of that stuff and, you know, in, in, in his upbringing. But when he was in the desert, in the temptation, hungry because he hasn't eaten in 40 days, I think the Holy Spirit goes, hey, here's what you need. Bloop, drops it in his mind. Speak this. This is the truth. Don't follow him. Don't do it. Right? That's the Holy Spirit's job. Right? He brings back to remembrance all those things that we've been taught. And so as we walk by the Spirit, we'll see him working in and through us to deal with the remaining power of sin in our lives. As we follow the Holy Spirit, we'll see the sin dwindling more and more and more. Will we be absolutely sinless? No. 
or will we see it decreasing? Absolutely. And so what I want us to do for the remainder of this morning, about the next 15 minutes or so, I want us to look at three things that the Holy Spirit does in relation to sin. First one is found in John chapter 16. John chapter 16, starting in verse 8. So three things specifically the Holy Spirit does in relation to us overcoming sin. John chapter 16, verse 8. We'll back up a little bit, right? We'll go back up to verse 7. But I tell you the truth. This is Jesus speaking now. It is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Right? I can only think of the disciples going, how can this be good that you're leaving me? <laughs> There's no way. But he goes, it's, it's for your good that I'm going away because I'll send the counselor. Verse 8, when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. And the, only one, the first one I want us to look at is in regards to sin. Right? He'll convict the world of guilt in regard to sin. Notice I said convict. I did not say condemn, not condemn. Right? The Holy Spirit will never, ever condemn you. Right? Romans 8, 1, we looked at it last week briefly. Right? There's now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So when you're starting to deal with a sin or you're starting to feel that, you know, your brother or sister comes up and, and wants, says, hey, I see this in your life. What's your response? Do you feel condemned or do you feel convicted? Right? Because if it's, con- if it's condemnation that you're experiencing, right, that comes from the devil. That's his work. Right? And, and, and we need to be very careful in the church as followers of Christ, as ambassadors of his, is, that we don't do the devil's work by bringing, bringing and heaping condemnation on people. Holy Spirit came to convict. That's his job. Sometimes he uses me and you to bring that conviction and to deliver that conviction, right? Nathan with David. Right? Sometimes he uses us to deliver that conviction. But it's definitely not condemnation. And I believe there's a simple way to know which you are experiencing. The right? next time you're sitting in a spot and, you're, and you've got this battle going on and you're sitting there going, oh, I don't know, am I being, con-? you know, I, I just feel so condemned or do I feel convicted? Which one? There's a simple way to look at it. What do, what, does what is being said right, lead you to want to run to God? That's conviction. Or to hide from God? That's condemnation. Right, if it's what's being said goes, you know what? It sits in your spirit and you go, yeah, I need to run to God. I need to be cleansed. I need to be forgiven. I need to repent. I need to. That's conviction. God, I need you. I'm running to you for hope. I'm running to you for cleansing. There is conviction. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit works in our heart and goes, that needs to go. And the only way that can go is as you run to Christ. Condemnation does the other side, right? It causes you to hide from God. Right? Somebody brings it up and goes, you know what, this is what I see in your life. And you go, oh my goodness, God, I don't want to run to God. I don't. And we start to feel condemned and we want to hide ourselves from, from God and from other people. Because of our guilt, because of our shame. And that's condemnation. So if you find yourself wanting to run to God for cleansing, to repentance and forgiveness, you can be assured you're experiencing the Holy Spirit's work of conviction. But if you can find yourself going, I need you, God, that's the Holy Spirit's work of conviction in your life. Because he causes us to see our sin and needs to deal with it in a correct way. So Holy Spirit brings conviction of sin. Next point, another way the Holy Spirit works in us is to give us the power to deal with our sins. We already looked in, in Galatians 5, 16, right? It's through the Spirit right, that, we, that we overcome the desires of the flesh. But Romans 8, Romans chapter 8, verses 13 and 14, put it a little bit different. Right? We start to realize that it's only through Him that we can overcome sin. Romans chapter 8, verse 12 through 14. Therefore, brothers... Paul's talking to believers again. He's talking to the Roman church. He goes, therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. Here it is, verse 13. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. (laughs) If you live according to the sinful nature, 
you will die. No ifs, ands, or buts, no questions about it. Right? If that's what you want to live, you'll die an eternal death. But the second part of that verse is amazing. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of this body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Back to Galatians 5.18, right? If you're led by the Spirit, right? And he says here, if you're led by the Spirit of God, you're sons of God. But in that previous verse, it says, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds. You and I need the Holy Spirit to put to death the misdeeds of the flesh. We can't do it by ourselves, according to Romans 8.13. If by the Spirit you put to death these things. <laughs> right, how, how, how great of a promise is that, right? That if we'll walk by the Spirit, if we'll trust the Spirit, He will help us to put to death the misdeeds of the body. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, you can just jot them in your notes. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13 says, you know what, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Right? We've got a lot of work to do. We've got to get busy. We've got to deal with the sin. We've got to put to death these things and we've got to put on these things as we looked at in Colossians, right? working out our salvation. But verse 13 says, knowing that God is at work within you to will and to act according to His good purpose. Right? God is at work in us to make us and to lead us down the path that pleases Him. He knows we can't do it by ourselves, so He goes, I'm not leaving you by yourself. I'm sending you a helper to help you walk this path. Because I know you're going to need it. Your flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. And in my guess is your spirit is willing as well. I pray your spirit is willing to allow this cleansing and this conviction to take place, but your flesh is weak. Right? Your flesh goes, no, 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 I'd really rather not. Right? And there's times for that, I think, that our flesh hides away, and maybe we're just not ready for it yet. Don't know, but the flesh is weak. And then flip with me to Philippians chapter 4. It's often misquoted, I think, but Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. And I know that I may be going a little fast because I, this is where I love having you guys all in place because I can hear Bibles turning. I can hear the pages turning. I go, okay, I think most people are there now. I can stop. I can't hear your Bibles at home flipping. So I'm trying to judge of how, long, how, how much time I give you to do this. But Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And that verse gets thrown out there, and it's absolutely true, right? That we can do all these things through Christ who gives me strength. But in context, right, when you start to think about this verse, right, if you slide back up a little bit, he goes in verse 10, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Here's the context of what this verse is talking about. I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And so if you look at the Apostle Paul in this verse, right, he's really kind of talking about the fact that right, he, he's, he's learned to be content rather being, than being dissatisfied. The Apostle Paul's learning to be content, right, instead of being ungrateful. There's this battle going on in Paul, going, and I've got to imagine as a minister, right, going out there, living this life out and doing the ministry on the missions, right, he's going, these people haven't given me anything. And he says he'd have every right to that, and he could live that way out. He goes, but instead I'm rejoicing in the fact because I've come to realize that I can be content no matter what because of who God is. Because He's the one who's going to give me the strength no matter what. In any and every situation. And so Paul has put to death these things of ungratefulness and ingratitude and, and you know, maybe being um, dissatisfied. And he's put on the ability to be content. And so this verse, when you think about it in relation to those types of battles going on in the inner man, Right, that God gives us the strength for. And I can face these things. Right? It should give us encouragement that no matter what sin we're working on, right, take your pick. Right? And maybe some of them you already know. Right? Take your pick. No matter what sin you're working on, be it your pride or your impatience or your gossip or any other one, 
the Holy Spirit will enable and empower you to overcome it if you'll allow him to. Right? I'm never going to be a patient person. That's not true. Right? That's, not a, that's not the truth of God's word. That's not reality. Right? If we'll allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, we can become a patient person. Paul could become content no matter what the situation was. It was possible that Paul could find peace in the, in the, in the season that he was in. All because the Holy Spirit gives him the power to go forth. Sometimes I know, right? Seems, sometimes the Holy Spirit seems to hold back his power, though. Ever been there? You're, you're dealing with a situation, you're, you're being honest, and you feel like, you know what, yep, I'm being convicted, and so I'm running to you, Holy Spirit, I need your help, and would you give me the power to overcome this or whatever? And you're sitting in the situation, and, and, and all of a sudden it feels like, oh, wait a minute, Holy Spirit, where did you go? <laughs> Hello? Are you there? <laughs> Do you hear me? Holy Spirit, are you anywhere to be found? And it seems like he's nowhere to be found. And it's like, I want your strength, I want your help. And I think it's that, that exact reason that he does sometimes pulls back a little bit. I think it's for that very reason that he allows us, right, in my own experience, right, he, he backs away a little bit and doesn't instantly just pour his power on because he allows it to show me of my utter dependence on him to overcome sin in my life. Right, I think it's easy to say that I'm dependent upon the Holy Spirit to overcome sin, but in practical everyday living, sometimes I live as though it all depends upon me. I've got this. Right? And, I, and, I, and I know what I should do, and so I'm going to go and do it, by golly. And I start to even do biblical things to overcome sin, and I'm doing it all in my strength. And the Holy Spirit goes, go ahead. <laughs> I need you to see. I'm going to back away for a minute. I need you to see <laughs> that you're dependent upon me. And so sometimes I think the Holy Spirit steps back and holds back his power for a season. Not in eternity, not, not forever, but he holds back for a moment, you know, for a season to allow us to see our utter need and dependence upon him. When I start to think I can do it on my own, is more often than not when the Holy Spirit steps back. Even when he starts, and, and this is a danger, church, the Holy Spirit reveals step one. <laughs> and he goes, you need to do this. And we go, okay, I got it, I'm going to take that step. And then before we know it, we've left the Holy Spirit five steps back because we think we understood the next steps. And that's a dangerous spot to be. And we need to make sure we're staying in step with him as we go through this. And the last point about the Holy Spirit is this. He uses circumstances of our lives to grow us spiritually. I don't know what circumstances you're going in with right now. I know what circum I mean, we can look at the circumstances of, our, of this pandemic that's out there, right? And there's these things that have taken place that have, made, you know, that, have, that have changed our lives in drastic ways, for at least for the time being, right? And so we're making adjustments and we're making changes and we're doing these things and Maybe it's for some of us, we've seen the fact that, I mean, I know just talking with people in the church and outside of the church that I've interacted with, you know, at different times, and they started to realize that there was things that they have not been doing well at home. Right? They have, they've lost the importance of their family, or they've lost the importance of quiet time with God, or they've, they've seen the opportunity to, to, to minister to one another, and to, and to read, and to study by themselves, and how they weren't doing that before, and all these things. And so he's using circumstances to change us. And if you've been any bit on the physical side, right, we, we, we realize that our physical muscles will not grow in strength apart from exercise. Right? There's no way possible that if I don't sit there and continuously work out my muscles and, you know, and time, right, and anybody else who does it, I can't go and get on a bench and think I'm going to lift 300 pounds. It's not going to happen. I'm going to get on there, and I'm going to get on that bench, and I'm going to go, okay, I'm going to raise 300 pounds because I want to lift 300 pounds. And I'm going to grab the bar, and I'm going to push, and nothing's going to happen to the bar because I never worked out my muscles. I never let them grow in strength by lifting 50 pounds and 100 pounds and 150 pounds and 175 pounds and working my way up to be able to lift 300 pounds. And I think it's the same thing in our spiritual life. We will not grow apart from challenges. We will not grow apart from circumstances. That's why it says in James chapter 1. Flip with me there real quick. James chapter 1. Verses 2 through 4. James chapter 1. Verses 2 through 4. It says this. Consider it pure joy, my brothers. 
Well, here it comes. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, very similar situation, very similar statement, right? God uses circumstances, uses trials, uses different things in our lives to cause our faith to grow. If we never had trials, if we never had conflicts, if we never had struggle, right, our faith would not grow. Right? We need these trials to draw us in, to let us go back to the truth of the word, to put in the faith, to take actions and going, God, I know your word says this. I don't see it right now, but my, by faith I'm going to take a step and do it. And then we do that, our faith grows. So if you're prone to sinful anger, right, just hanging out just a few of these out, if you're prone to sinful anger, there will be circumstances that trigger your anger. I'm not saying God, God is tempting you to get angry, right? and I'll mention that here in a minute as we go to continue down in James chapter 1. Right? I'm not saying he's tempting you to sin, but there's going to be ample circumstances that, you're gonna, that, the, that the Father is going to allow us to experience to go, huh, how's that going? How's your anger going? Right? Are you dealing with that? Right? Have, you, have, you, have you processed some of it? Right? Has your wick grown? Or is it still really short? Maybe you're not an anger issue. Maybe it's just that you tend to be judgmental towards other people. Maybe you have a problem with being judgmental. Right? You'll, chances are you'll have plenty of opportunities, plenty of occasions to let your judgment be known. You're going to find yourselves in situations where judgment can be cast. And it's in those moments you're going to get the opportunity to see, am I going to hold my tongue? Am I going to pray for that person? Am I going to speak life to that person? Or instead, am I going to cast judgment on the person? Right? There's going to be opportunities to do that, circumstances that will allow for that. And maybe it's, and especially in our society today, right? if you easily become anxious, you'll have plenty of situations that will give opportunity to deal with your anxiety. Maybe this is just one of those things, be able to deal with your anxiety, right? Do I really trust that God's in control of everything? Right? Do I really believe that in the midst of this COVID-19 that God is still on the throne? That he's still in control, that, not, that this did not catch him by surprise? That God's going, oh boy, I missed this one. No, he didn't miss anything. Right? And so maybe if we're prone to anxiety and things, and these things are causing us to worry, and they're causing all these anxious thoughts in our, in our lives, Maybe this is an opportunity of the Holy Spirit convicting and going, hey, that's not right for a follower of Christ. I want that out of your lives, right? I want you to be able to live at peace. I want you to be able to have confidence in the things that God's promised. I want you to be calm in the midst of the storm. Maybe the Holy Spirit's bringing some conviction through this situation. And as I said, in all of these things and in all of these circumstances, please do not think that God is testing you, or tempting you, I should say. James chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. What a beautiful thing to think about, right? Blessed is the man or the woman who perseveres under trial, who doesn't give up. Right? You will be blessed. There's a promise there, right? You will be blessed. You will find peace. You will be happy at the end. Right? There, you'll be blessed if you'll persevere. Because when he has stood the test, right? There's a test, right? There's the trial. There's a test, right? When he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Verse 13, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Here's where, the, here's where sin comes in. Here's where the flesh needs to be put to death. Verse 14, but each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Here's the problem. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to what? Right? After desire has been conceived, after it's there, I'm going, oh, I really, really want that. I really don't want to do this. I really want it. Right? After it's desire has right, been conceived, it leads, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. How important is it to deal with sin in our lives? And right? I'm not saying that we're going to deal with it and we're going to, you know, we're going to save ourselves because that's not true. Right? Christ has already done that for us. Christ has saved us. But it is important that we put these sins to death as we walk after Christ. And these circumstances that God is using, that the Holy Spirit is using, are not temptations to lead you to sin. They're trials that are building your faith. They're testings that allow us to see that our faith is real.
They're testings that allow us to prove that God is who he says he is. And so the importance that I want us to understand is that God is in control of every circumstance that you're dealing with today. Everything that you're dealing with, God is in control. He's aware of it. He's not caught off guard by it. And he's using them in ways that we do not always understand to change us more and more into the likeness of Christ. Increasingly so. And I know we're just at a close. Romans 8.28. We'll close with Romans 8.28. Huge promise, huge reminder, huge encouragement as we close out today. Romans 8.28 and 29. And we know that in all things, and no matter what's going on, God, is, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Here's, the, here's what the good he's working, though. The good he's working is found in verse 29. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. God is using all the circumstances that are taking place in your life. The Holy Spirit is taking all of those things to mold us and shape us into the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what he's doing with all of them. That's what all these things are at place. And so the Holy Spirit takes the gospel message, reminds us of everything that Christ has done, and he brings conviction of sin. He doesn't just leave us there. He brings us the empowerment needed to face that sin and to deal with it, to put it to death. Right? And lastly, he uses the circumstances of our lives to help facilitate that death. The question is, will we come into agreement with him? The question is, will we partner with him? Or will we instead fight against it by yielding to the sinful nature? That's the challenge before us as we start to look at these respectable sins in the coming weeks. Are you the temptation to follow the flesh and justify yourself? Or there's the option to follow the gospel and the Holy Spirit and let him actually process it out of our lives? Let's go ahead and close out in prayer. God, we are so thankful that you have sent us a helper. We thank you that we have the gospel message clearly portrayed before us in our Bibles that we can go back and look at scripture after scripture of the truths and the promises that you have made for us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Holy Spirit, would you continue to draw us close? Would you continue to strengthen us to overcome those things, those sin in our lives? Bring conviction where conviction is needed. And Holy Spirit, when you do bring conviction, let us come into agreement with you as we go forward to process it out of our lives, as we go to put it to death through your strength. Help us to rely upon you in an increasing fashion, realizing that none of this is possible apart from you. We need your help, Holy Spirit. We need you to bring back in our times of trial the remembrance of the promises of God, the goodness of the gospel, the truth and the reality of our need of it. And then you give us the strength to turn our back, to turn around, to repent and to walk towards Christ and to leave the things of the world, to leave the things of the sinful nature behind, that you would receive even greater honor and glory, that they would see our good works as is referenced in our worship time and that they may give praise and honor and glory to our Father who is in heaven. That's our heart's desire, God. I pray that as we come to celebrate Easter, we would do our part to let the world know that there is a resurrected one who has come to set them free, that has paid the price if they would allow that to happen, if they would confess you as their Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.